Hi, I'm Kevin Morris from Slowboat.com. I'm Sam Landsman from Slowboat.com. And I'm Laura Domola from Slowboat.com. And today we're going to be talking about flying drones from boats. So, Kevin and Sam, what's the big deal about drones? For me, drones give a way to to get a different perspective on boating. When you're driving around in a boat, you're generally at sea level. And so drones get you up above, you can look down, you can see all kinds of things you couldn't see before. They're a whole lot of fun. They're easy to fly now. They're affordable. Like Kevin was saying, they give you a whole new perspective on boating. For most of us who can't afford the mega yacht out in the harbor with a helicopter on the aft deck, this is as close as we'll get. Well, and that brings up a thing. In just the last few years, drones have become really affordable. The price has dropped from many, many thousands of dollars down to where you can get quite a few different drones for less than a thousand dollars. Which makes it not so painful if one falls out of the sky, which we'll talk about later. That one should fall out of the sky. It's less painful. Now, yes. Well, it's kind of the ultimate selfie stick, right? You can get a really cool view of yourself and your boat. So let's look at some photos. Speaking of that, Sam, this looks like one that you're flying. Where is this? Yeah, this is in Alaska in Taku Harbor, just south of Juneau. And this is using the drone as a selfie stick. I've got my twin brother and my mom out on the dock with me. And nobody else was around to take our picture. So we had the, uh, the drone do the, the photography. Nice. Yeah, you were with me in the Octopus Islands in British Columbia, right. and we were up over our anchorage and looking down. Well, and this is, I took this photo while you were flying the drone, which is right. cool with the one you fly. Yeah, we use a drone that allows one person to fly the drone, and then a second person with a different controller actually operates the camera, so you can aim the camera separately. That's a little bit of a high-end drone. Which it's, makes like, it... it's like my own tripod flying in the sky. <laughs> like, <laughs> little to the left, please. Yeah, it does make Click. it a little more scary to take off and land from a boat and fly over water, but it's nice to be able to have the two-person operation. Right. I love this straight-down shot, Sam, this next one. Yeah, there's so many different perspectives you can explore taking pictures from the air. And this was in Butedale, British Columbia, a ghost town in the uh, the central or northern British Columbia area. And you can't walk around these buildings. There's no access. It's all overgrown. It's uh, kind of the best way to see it. Yeah, and so this is why. Yeah. And it, it also, you, you don't risk your own health by exploring these, these <laughs> dilapidated old buildings. Well, and seeing this from this perspective, it is completely different than the way it looks from the from water. From the ground, oh, yeah. 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 From, the, from the water, you, just, you can see things are falling down, but this gives you a total Totally different view of it. Cool. This next one we took at the Conk Glacier, I think, right? right? Conk Glacier in southeast Alaska. We were on the way up there to uh, watch the Tidewater Glacier and see some ice falling into the sea. Uh, you can just sort of get an idea from looking down how many icebergs and little bergy bits there are floating around that you're going to have to navigate your boat through in order to get over toward the glacier. But again, it's just a really interesting perspective. I took this picture in Ford's Terror. That's also in southeast Alaska, and it's uh, a difficult place to get into. It's incredibly beautiful, but the charts there are totally inaccurate. Right. And so I took this aerial picture at low tide showing the entrance to Ford's Terror. And you can see these shoals here. None of those are on the chart. So the the drone is beyond just a toy at this point. It's for scouting and seeing... I mean, you could not see this. No, you, you can't see any of this from... A helicopter couldn't really get this. And to be able to do it affordably and, and easily, it certainly is cheaper than an insurance claim because you've hit a rock. Well, absolutely. And you can <laughs> see things just from this photo that are in direct contradiction to what's on the marine charts. So. Yep. All right. This next one, this is Octopus Islands, right, Kev? You were my tripod for this shot. This is. I think this mm-hmm. is another shot from yeah. maybe the same flight that the previous shot yeah, was from. Yeah, it could be different light. Sam, I think this is yours, this next one. Yeah, this was up in Leconte Glacier. You can just barely make out my boat on the left side there. It's lost in the ice. Oh, yeah. And then there was another boat I was traveling with here. And it, This is great for somebody to get this photo of their own boat. Yeah, and it's really fun to be able to take pictures of your own boat and friends' boats and see them from this vantage point. Well, in a few times we've taken pictures that have had other people's boats in them with their permission and then or not and forwarded the pictures (laughs) everybody you don't have to have permission you don't i mean you're far enough away you're not annoying them but if you happen to get an awesome photo that has their boat in it i've gone over and taken a photo to them or gotten their email address i mean sometimes when you're far away they would never even know this one is actually the lighthouse on pedos island in the san juan islands which is one of the last places before you cross over the border into Canada. And it's an example of a little bit of proximity flying using the drone to get up closer to things that you couldn't necessarily access or get a different perspective from up close. This one looks like Echo Bay. 
right? That is. That's Pierre's Echo Bay Marina in the Broughtons. Nice. This here is up at Dawes Glacier, the head of Endicott Arm, and, and I was leading a flotilla up there. So you've got our fleet of boats all together in front of this magnificent glacier. How fun. And being able to share this picture then with all the people on the, the other boats and, and they can show their friends, hey, look, this is my boat right in front of this glacier. I really went there. Yeah, that's great. I think I saw this posted a few times on social media as well. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. It was shared many times. Okay, so these photos are all super fantastic. How do you get started? What if I want to do this on my way up to Alaska? Well, of course, buy a drone. But then, uh, as with many times, with incredible power comes incredible responsibility. You need to be <laughs> sure that you know a few things, laws, regulations, sort of courtesy rules before you launch a drone in, especially around other people, other boats, and so forth. The first thing to do is, in the United States, if you have a drone, you need to register that drone. Uh, any of the drones that are carrying decent cameras are over the, it's about a half pound, 0.55 pounds. Any drone that weighs more than that needs to be registered. It's an easy process with the FAA. Does it cost anything? It does. It costs just a few dollars. I think it's $10 maybe. It's, it's an inexpensive, fast process. You can just write the number they give you on the drone with a Sharpie and you're good to go. What they're really doing is making sure that you know the law. So you'll have to acknowledge that you understand the, the laws surrounding drone use before they'll give you that number. And just the broad strokes for the law in the U.S., uh, there's a 400-foot maximum altitude. If you're flying anywhere within five miles of an airport, you're supposed to notify the tower before your flight. You're supposed to always maintain line of sight to the drone, so you're not supposed to be flying it so far away that you can't see it. Of right, and a lot of people do this, right? They use just a little screen on their drone or their FPV goggles, and then they will be tempted to fly the drone where they can't see it and navigate just by that. And you could lose your signal at any time. And then suddenly you're flying blind away where you can't I hate it. when you're flying it and I can't see it. <laughs> just come back. Of course, you should always yield to any manned aircraft traffic. Of so course. if you're seeing float planes around or, or other planes or helicopters, you need to, to stay out of their way. Yeah, and actually drones could be a, a significant hazard to manned aircraft. I, I fly full-size airplanes as well, and I, I don't want drones suddenly popping up and coming through my windshield. No. They could do significant damage on a flight. And part of the reason for the 400-foot maximum altitude is that under most conditions, regular airplanes are restricted to a minimum altitude of 500 feet. So it gives a little bit of a buffer. Right. That's Unless around an airport, true. but you're not supposed to fly around an airport anyway. Around so. an airport, crop dusting. There are tons of exceptions to that for mm. regular airplanes. So the rules should just be really work hard to stay away from any kind of a full-sized aircraft. If you're using your drone for any kind of commercial use, if you're taking pictures that you're going to be selling, you need to go through a different avenue for getting a license to operate that drone. And then finally, if you'd like to fly in national parks or state parks, you're probably you out can't. of luck. Yeah. Uh, most parks at this point have banned drone flying. Uh, there's probably some discretion involved. If you're the only person at a state park in the wintertime, you might get away with flying the drone. But if it's a busy summer weekend, right. uh, definitely when this, not a good idea. This first happened when we were in a state park and the guy, Ranger, came over. Even though we were in a field, there were no people. And you're like, sorry. Yeah, and that was actually before there was a prohibition. He just right. kind of decided he, he just didn't, decided. didn't want to see it there. And in Canada, the laws are similar. No flying within nine kilometers of an airport. There's a 300-foot maximum a altitude, lower. so a little lower than in the U.S. No flying near first responders, military or law enforcement. And that's not just Canada. I should honor the same thing in the United States. Um, there have been a number of incidents also where there were ongoing emergency or search and rescue operations going and people have flown drones in those area and interfered with the first responders. If there's any kind of emergency going, keep the drone on the ground, keep it away from people. You don't wanna risk lives and property by trying to get a look with a drone. Again, in Canada, commercial use requires special permits. In both Canada and the US, these commercial use laws have been changing rapidly. So I would check at the time you're ready to start doing it and be sure you understand what the laws are. And in Canada, they're also banned in national parks, the same as the United States. So what about other boats? Has anyone ever gotten annoyed at either one of you guys for flying nearby? Or do they even know? Well, the, the drones are noisy. They kind of sound like an angry bug when they're flying. And so they're certainly noticeable if you're launching or retrieving from a public place, people are going to see you. I've had a lot of curiosity. Nobody's ever gotten mad, but I like to be respectful when I fly it. So the typical response when somebody sees me taking off is curiosity. They want to come right. and see what this thing is, what it can do. They all ask how much it costs. I can see wives and girlfriends' eyes rolling as their husbands or boyfriends get this idea that they're going to 
buy another toy. <laughs> hey, girls can fly too. <laughs> but the key if you're around other people, I think, is respect. So don't buzz their boats. Ask permission before you fly, especially if you're going to be flying near their boat. And then offer to take photos. This is, is something people that I... People love this. Yeah. yeah. I've always offered if people are around to take photos or let them fly the drone. Mm -hmm. Email and, them photos And later. normally that offer, even if they don't take you up totally, breaks down any reticence they might be, Definitely. be showing towards you flying the drone. We've had the same experience. Yeah, and I find that a little bit of courtesy can go a long way. If you think of it the same way you think of it as a lawn and leaf blower, you know, people are out on their boats to try to enjoy themselves. You wouldn't walk up next to their boat on the dock and crank up a leaf blower without setting their expectations somehow. And a lot of times if you explain ahead of time, hey, this is only going to be in the air for five or ten minutes, you know, I want to be sure I don't bother you guys. If you'd like, while I'm up, I can take a picture of your boat and email it to you. That tends to go a long way. And usually, like Sam said, people are curious and they'll want to come see the view from the drone as you're flying it. And it becomes a positive experience instead of a negative one. That's the only experience we've ever had like that. It's all been good like that, curious and interested. Mm -hmm. It's true. But I've seen people have negative experiences and it always with, with the person flying the drone sort of presuming that it was going to be OK and not talking to people. Got it. There are definitely just best practices that people should follow. Right. All right. So really the, what we're getting at here is common sense fundamentally. So don't fly your drone if it's rainy or windy. These things aren't typically waterproof. I've flown it in winds as high as about 20 knots, uh, 25 knots. And uh, you run the risk in anything higher than that of losing the drone. It just is not powerful enough to overcome the wind. Right. And each drone has its own specifications for sort of the maximum amount of wind that it will handle. Right. Be sure you've read and understand those before you launch into any kind of a, a very strong wind. Don't fly when intoxicated. It's, uh, you know, you might have had a couple of beers in the afternoon. Hey, it's you're, a toy. You're uh, boasting to your your new friends in the dock and you, you get the drone out. But these things actually can hurt people. Uh, the blades and the propellers are spinning fast. And if they're several pound thing that slams into your boat or your head or or whatever, you can actually do some damage with them. Yeah. So don't fly while you're intoxicated. Don't fly near airports or over people, uh, large crowds of people. Drones are fairly reliable, but they have in the past done flyaways or failed in various ways that result in the loss of control. They don't want to hurt people, certainly, and property if you can avoid it. So, right. Yeah, I've personally had drones fall out of the sky. It doesn't take much one propeller failing. I had a propeller break on one one time. And if one propeller breaks, it's it's coming down. Right. And then you can't control where it's going to come down. So you don't want to start off over yeah. anyone's head. Right. Mm -hmm. Another thing is if you're going to be flying at a marina, ask the owner or the operator permission first. Most of the marina operators that I've met are totally fine with it. And would love an aerial shot of their marina. Right. The big concern here is you don't want to be a burden for them. You don't want to get in the way of their operations and you don't want to make their other guests feel awkward because you're you're flying your drone. What about wildlife? I just was thinking about those snot bots that they use on the humpbacks where they fly the drones over the humpback spouts and gather whale snot <laughs> for DNA testing. And it's super cool. But I, so I guess they're not disturbing them. That's a research thing. But I know that people get a little antsy about the whole flying over wildlife thing. What do you guys think of that? Yeah, generally, uh, you should not be harassing wildlife with yeah. a drone. It's a foreign object. They're Wildlife is probably super confused. If, if humans are, are generally confused when they see one, then wildlife would be really confused. And there have been some cases where people have actually been cited for flying drones over protected species like orcas. And so the line that I've heard so far, uh, and, and this is all evolving because the, as the, the legislation is catching up with the technology, treat the drone like you treat a boat when you're watching whales. So there's a, a 200 mm. yard distance that you need to keep your boat away from the whales and, and same story with your drone. Yeah, and there are actually, in research now, a lot of applications where drones are used to gather data and information on wildlife. Right. And they're less disruptive than other means. Right, because you could not do that survey of all of the humpback DNA there's just no way. Oh, right. And the, the way they did that before was actually to, you know, fire darts at the whale and attach various things to the whale's body. So flying over its spout. Way less several invasive. Feet is way less invasive. Also, a lot of times, you know, where they would be flying helicopters or full scale aircraft to check data about species, they can do that with a drone. And so, but most of these things are commercial activities, research activities that require a permit. You can't do them anyway as a recreational flyer. Right. So if I've never flown a drone and I wanna be taking photos like this and doing some of this stuff, what's the best way for me to learn how to fly a drone? Is it easy? Is it really hard? How do you learn? They've certainly made drones easier to fly in the last few years. We've finally gotten to the point where there's drones you can let go and they will hover in place and, and not just immediately crash if you're not actively 
doing something every second. Right. But so you've been flying drones, Kevin, for what? I've been flying drones for five or six years. Okay. I've built 10 or 12. Oh, cool. Okay. And Sam, what about you? You've recently, yeah, the I last just bought, couple of years? I just, I just bought my first and only drone so far about six, seven months ago. So and you've learned pretty recently. How did you find it when you started? I, I found it surprisingly easy. I didn't fly for the first time off the boat. I uh, Good. <laughs> so, so when you first get your drone, go and practice on an open field where there are not power poles around and there's Absolutely. not trees right next door. It doesn't take much to, to for one of these drones to fall out of the sky. Just tapping into almost anything will result in a crash. So it's best to learn over a field. These drones don't float and they're not waterproof typically. So if you end up in the water, your drone is gone. It's either gonna be gone or broken or probably both. So practice over a large open field, that's the best place. Uh, again, when there aren't people nearby, you don't wanna be driving your drone into somebody because you're not confident in the operation. Take it slowly, just take it out into the field and practice the controls. And remember that these, these newer drones, you just take your hands off the stick if you're ever confused. The drone will hover in place until you can reorient yourself. Okay, yeah, so flying from a moving boat has gotta be pretty tricky though. You know, so what's that transition like? Like starting to fly it from the boat, is it super scary? Well, yeah, you said a moving boat. My first advice would be stop the stop boat. Stop the boat, right. <laughs> I agree. The I, I've flown the, the drone quite a bit from the boat now, including from a moving boat. And it takes a lot of practice to feel comfortable launching and retrieving from a moving boat. So stop the boat before you take off or land. It's much easier. You're less distracted. Remember, you're the captain of your boat, too. You need to be responsible for the boat first. And you don't want to be distracted from your duties uh, running the boat when you're flying your drone. So stop the boat, and then you can, can launch and retrieve. The other thing is if you're launching and retrieving from moving boat, the drone will hover in place, but the boat might run right into that drone or a, an antenna or a piece of rigging or a railing or, or any number of things. So even though the drone will hover, uh, the boat could run right into it. Right. Once the drone is launched, it's holding itself on a GPS position and it doesn't know that the, the wind is blowing the boat around, the right. boat might be moving, drifting, doing all kinds of things. So, So how do you guys launch from your boat? Do you hold it? Do you take it off from the top deck or what? Well, I think we have different approaches on this. Yeah, all of the above at times. The kind of drone I fly, I always launch it from it sitting on the deck of the boat. I launch it from that. Uh, it has a retractable landing gear that comes up after that. And then when I come back, I always land it on the deck of the boat. It has 13 inch props. They spin very fast. So getting your hands around it is dangerous because of the way the landing gears retract and come down. There's not necessarily something to grab onto when it's in the air. So it's just not as well designed for hand for a launching. hand launch or retrieve. Right, as the kind of drone that Sam uses. We did that on one of your old drones a couple times yes. because it had some sort of landing gear that stuck down away from the props. But it even then, it was still a little a little hairy. Right, and you want one that's kind of not so much of a lawn power tool that you're trying to catch. <laughs> it's like right. trying to grab your lawnmower from the bottom or something. <laughs> right. Really not advised. Right, and Sam, what about you? You launch and retrieve by hand, right? Yeah, typically if I'm underway and I'm, I'm launching while moving, I always launch by hand. Right. Um, otherwise, the by the time the drone gets in the air, the rail on the boat will have hit the drone and, and it'll crash. So I have to hold the drone high enough that it's clear of any deck hardware. And landing it, if you're not comfortable in the controls, it can be a lot easier to just hover the thing over the boat somewhere and then walk over and grab it out of the sky rather than having to maneuver it around rigging or rails or anything like that. So This should only be done if it's safe to do it. Absolutely. These little blades are sometimes not so little and they're very fast moving. If you got one into an eye, it would be very easy to lose an eye that way and they can cut you or bruise you or this is not worth hurting yourself for so only do it if it's safe some of these drones you can get propeller guards that can somewhat alleviate the issue but uh, you still run the risk of jamming a, a finger or something between that propeller guard and Ouch. the propeller yeah i've seen pretty nasty injuries from people getting hit by drone props so don't think of them as a toy that way think of them the same way you think of a power tool right and so is this similar to flying where altitude is your friend, you know, up to three or 400 feet legal altitude. Yeah, I think the first thing I always do when I take off is I get high quickly. The idea is that I want to be- And by high, you mean altitude. <laughs> right. Yeah, so when we go back, we're not intoxicated when we're flying this. Right. But I want to get clear of any obstacles. So the top of the antennas are, are maybe 20 feet off the water. I want to make sure that I'm clear of any of that kind of stuff before I start flying around in, in circles or exploring further. And same if you're on land, it's good to get above any trees or power poles or things like that or nearby, just so you, you don't have one less thing to worry about once you're clear of the land-based obstacles. I would right. think it would be pretty hard on a 
sailboat to have a drone? It would be difficult. It would be challenging to find a place to launch from all on the, the boat with all the rigging. rigging. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sam's hand launching strategy would probably work a lot better than my need to find a flat place to take off and land with sufficient clearance. Yeah, and you really need to be aware of the, the rigging, on, particularly on a sailboat, but anytime you have stays and, and all that kind of stuff going in different directions, because just the slightest nick of a stay on a prop and that drone is tumbling into the water. So right. And they, your sail might be following it. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you won't damage the rigging too. That, <laughs> yeah, and I wouldn't do it under sail anyway. That seems like too many things going on at once. So what if you're flying and you lose sight of your drone? I hate this part, but it happens. So what if, what if you can't see it anymore? You should always fly within sight of your drone. It's required by law. In right, but sometimes you look away and then you're like, oh crap, where is it? Right. If you lose sight of it, well, most drones have a return to home feature that will automatically engage when the drone gets out of radio range and it, and it can't pick up its controller anymore. Or anytime it somehow loses contact with the controller, you can also manually activate that. If you've somehow lost track of where the drone is and you can't find it, you can manually activate it. Don't rely on this on a boat because it's returning to the place that it took off from, the GPS coordinates. and Which and is not going to be where you are. Right. Boats move. Yeah. Sam, have you ever had to use return to home? I have on occasion flown it out of its range and it started to return to home, but I've always been able to regain control before it returned or home. Or to see it. Uh, all you the can, way. Right. You can see it. And then once you see it, you can cancel return to home. Yeah. And, and that's a really important thing. You need to know how to cancel the return to home if you regain control of the drone. because Right. Because that's the dramatically... Word, the, sad. You don't, <laughs> you you don't want to watch this thing go and slowly <laughs> lower itself right into the water uh, as you're scrambling as you're to get into your, your dinghy to go and, and rescue it. So yeah, you the, know how to cancel a return to home because sometimes it, the signal will drop out even if you're not flying particularly far from the controller. For whatever reason, the signal just drops out. Right. And, and, and you talked about home. flying in front of the boat too. Like, so What's your theory on that? Yeah. So if you're shooting underway, the return to home is then totally useless because it's going to be wherever you took off from. Let's assume for a moment here that you're driving your boat in a straight line. So you took off, you're driving forward, and you want to keep the drone in front of the boat because that way if you fly it too far and it loses signal, to get back to where it took off from, it has to fly right back over your boat. So you have a chance to regain control. Right. If you are flying it behind the boat and you lose signal, the drone is going to go away from you, right? Fly away from you okay. back to where it took off from. You'll wonder why it's suddenly getting smaller. Yeah, and, you'll, <laughs> and you'll be turning the boat around and applying maximum throttle and you still probably won't catch up to it. So fly it in front of the boat and, and that gives you at least a fighting chance of, of regaining the signal. And I'd say for a lot of people, especially this is an area of the operation manual of your drone that you should really be familiar with. And that's another thing I would recommend practicing in an open field. Mm -hmm. Because when you suddenly lose control of your drone and you're a little bit panicked, it's not the time to be, oh, let's see, let's find how my manual, I? turn yeah. to page 72, and how right. to disengage, return to home, and regain control. You want to know that pretty fluently before you launch. Good tip. One of the things here it's important is remember safety first, uh, not just in the protecting your fingers and eyes and so forth from Other the power blades or other people, but don't be so engrossed in what you're doing with the drone that you are not paying attention to the conditions around you. Maybe there's a boat that went by and, and threw a wake. Don't fall overboard because you're looking at the drone and not at your surroundings. Similarly, don't drop the controller overboard because then you'll probably lose the controller, the drone, and your phone. That ends up being a, a very well, expensive day. And so your next... phone because a lot of the drones use an iPhone to control them, right? Right. A lot of them will use a, a cell phone or a tablet, either iOS or Android, as the video display. So they you make neck straps that you can get for the controller, that's a good idea when you're flying from a boat, just like you'd wear neck straps and the, the binoculars. And then if you're wearing the FPV goggles... An uh, FPV is first person view. Yeah. It makes it so it feels like you're flying the drone, you're in the drone. Right. But if you're wearing those, you need to be extra cautious about what you're doing. You don't want to be walking around on the deck of your boat wearing the goggles and trip over something. Or, well, and that's a really good idea. Or walk off the edge. Right. And to have a spotter if, you've, if you're doing that is what, what we always did. Or sit yourself down somewhere and, right. and just go along for the ride. Yeah. And FPV goggles can be disorienting. I've seen people standing there wearing FPV goggles and just fall over because <laughs> <laughs> they lost reference to the ground. They're, they're engrossed in the immersive view from the drone. The drone will bank a little bit or something and they just flat fall on the ground. <laughs> Funny, but embarrassing. So I know you guys probably have some ways that you think about your flying. Can you each talk about your psychology when you're flying over the water or just flying in general? Other uh, than sheer panic? Right, not that. <laughs> but like, what do you think about when you take off and do you have sort of a way you think about it? 
I have a little bit of a checklist that I go through before I launch each time. I check to make sure that all my props have been tightened. I never take off without a full battery. I try to always return and land while the battery still has more than a third of its power left. As much as possible, if I'm flying with visual reference, then I try to keep the back of the drone pointed toward me so the control orientation is always the same, left is left and right is right. And yeah. I, I try to keep in mind, you know, anytime something feels a little wrong, I'll let go of the sticks, let things settle out, and then right. gradually work my way back into There's making my way back home. Like a way, sort of a set kind of list of your personal rules. Right. Yeah, I'm a little bit more reckless with with the drone. <laughs> Not reckless in the dangerous sense, but the only thing I'm endangering is the drone itself. Part of this is probably because I have a, a relatively inexpensive drone uh, and it's a tool to get cool photos and, and at some point it's going to go for a swim and, and that's just how it is. Right. So I, I went into it knowing that, but I still am cautious. I don't want to lose it. One of the things that I find is super helpful when flying, especially taking off and landing uh, on the boat, is to just control one axis at a time. So say I'm positioning to bring it in for a landing, I'll lower it down to the altitude I want and then position it, move it left, right, forward and back one at a time rather than trying to do everything all at once uh, and then mm -hmm. overreacting. Or That's a great idea. Over yes. Yeah. And because uh, it's probably pretty easy to get panicked if it's not doing what you want or if it's windy. Mm -hmm. or so one idea, you either position it directly overhead and then lower it down slowly and grab it out of the sky, or alternately you could lower it down and then fly it backwards towards you, into you kind of, and, and grab it out of the sky. But just rather than trying to fly it in one kind of glide path down from altitude, just adjust one at a time. There's no reason to, that you need to do any more. So I've seen you launch your drone from your boat and then take off driving your boat and have the drone follow you. And you mentioned something about a Mustang. Or whatever. Yeah. I, I treat it like I'm a, a 16 year old with a new Mustang that you know, I, I, I drive it like I, I rented it. And, and uh, <laughs> the thing is, remarkably, I still have it. Thought for sure that I was going to crash it somewhere in Alaska. I remember when we were at Ford's Terra, we had one battery with us. And yeah. We did a couple of flights. We had probably 20 minutes of flying. And Is this when we were surveying the, the yeah, entrance and, and, there? Yeah, and then it was, I wanted to get a shot of me coming through in the dinghy, and there was like four minutes of flight time left. I and, remember that. <laughs> oh, might as well go for it. They, uh, <laughs> and, and we got it back. We didn't crash it, but it was that was definitely right on the edge of... What you're comfortable uh, yeah. with. Yeah. Well, this brings up an interesting point, because Sam and I were both in Forge Terror at the same time. Yeah. We both had our drones... Sam got the pictures because Sam had a drone he wasn't afraid to fly in that environment <laughs> and in that situation. Not afraid to lose. <laughs> right. I mean, that's the thing. I would have had to load mine into the dinghy and, you know, the saltwater spray as you're going several miles in the dinghy yeah. in sort of rough water even to get to the flying location. So, well, and Sam's is smaller. It was in your backpack, wasn't it? Yeah, and I generally would advise people if your intent is to fly this thing from your boat, don't buy the most expensive drone. Don't in fact, buy one that is so expensive that you'd be horribly upset if you lost it. Buy something that you're not going to be afraid to use because that's how you're going to get the good pictures. It's not going to be if it's sitting in the boat dry and warm and well charged. Uh, that doesn't do any good. So get something that's inexpensive enough that you're willing to fly it regularly. Right, because things happen. Yeah. Kevin, you've lost two drones. I, I have <laughs> lost two drones, uh, both over water, ironically enough. Yeah. So it is a thing that happens. One of mine was due to a mechanical failure. It just fell out of the sky, and I have no idea what happened to it. It landed in some we tidal waters. We never saw it again. Another one is flying here along in Fury Cove, I believe, in British yeah. Columbia. Yeah, North Cape Caution. And uh, yeah, we just crossed Cape Caution, so feeling pretty confident and flying the drone around and getting a few pictures and just flying along straight and level and oh, things went a little bit sour right about there. Yeah. Awry. <laughs> it landed on the rocks. We were able to find pieces and stuff. But we did find bits and pieces. It's never been fully explained what happened to that drone. Uh, and saltwater is unfriendly. Once a drone hits saltwater, you're not likely to have many pieces that are salvageable. Right. I think I salvaged a GoPro camera out of that miraculously. Yeah, still that worked. landed in a tide pool and was still okay. Which brings up another tip. Don't ever take off for a second flight before you've downloaded the pictures from the first flight. Good uh, tip. Treat every flight like it could be the last. Exactly, because and it could. <laughs> it could well be. And so copy your pictures over every time. SD cards are very inexpensive. Right. So maybe just get a few of those and you can swap out the card between flights. You don't want to lose a, some excellent pictures because you were, went up a second time to try to get that, that last flight. That last great yes. picture. So I know that I'm partial to still photos because it's what I do, but what about video? You guys haven't talked really about video. How do you feel about that? Video is a lot of work, both to store and edit and then look through. It's just, it's 
for me, for most stuff, it's just too much work. Stills are a lot easier to share. They're yeah. a lot quicker. You um, usually don't have super fast internet on a boat, right? Right. Well, to, just as an, sort of a point of reference, it's going to take a thousand times more storage to store a video of a flight than it is probably all the still pictures you could take. That goes through your whole workflow. The amount of time it takes to edit and the video editor is right. huge. And you've made a few really great videos, but and I know it was super time consuming. They're a tremendous amount of work. It's also much harder to fly the drone in order to get good video. Oh, because yeah. Because then you're flying a moving camera that, and the motion of the drone is an important part of the shot. I find that if you're trying to shoot video, most of the interesting video is when you're up really close to something in proximity then the typical times you're flying when you're boating the drones up high and what you're looking for is that big overall panoramic perspective and you get that just as well in a still photo if not better than you do trying to shoot video which can end up being boring so perfect my advice would be skip the video for most of your boating use and just use still photos well thanks so much for listening thanks, if you have any you guys. questions yeah. if you have any questions post in the video below let us know at slowboat.com and we'll be happy to answer as best as we can yeah thanks for joining us to see more of our educational boating videos, subscribe to our Slow Boat YouTube channel. If you're on Facebook, you can follow us at facebook.com slash slowboatlife. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at slowboatlife. And of course, you can always find us on slowboat.com. Until next time, see you on the water.